Suzanne Dazan, welcome to our panel on legacies of the French Revolution across time and distance. Uh, first, I just want to comment that this morning when I was perusing my colleagues' CVs and committing them to memory, I realized that every last one of them went to the University of California, Berkeley, as did I. So that occurs to me then that we may have missed somebody. So if you went to Berkeley, come on up, join the panel. <laughs> Our first speaker is going to be Jeremy Popkin, and I'm going to keep the introductions short because this is such a terrific panel I could go on at length uh, about their accomplishments. Uh, he is William T. Bryan, Chair of History at University of Kentucky. He made his name working on the French Revolutionary Press, uh, writing several fantastic books, then some textbooks, and then he completely switched fields to the Haitian Revolution, uh, writing the prize-winning book, You Are All Free, The Haitian Revolution and the Abolition of Slavery, uh, really challenging existence. Existing, existing approaches. His collection of documents facing racial revolution is fantastic to use for teaching. He is going to speak today about the French Revolution and the European project. Good morning. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Uh, Suzanne uh, forgot to mention one thing about uh, my biography, uh, which is that I was born in the neighborhood in uh, Iowa City, Iowa, which uh, is just about 20 miles uh, south of uh, the town that in my early childhood I thought was called Cedar Rabbits. <laughs> Last spring, I taught a new course on Europe since 1989. One of the main themes I discussed with my students was the uh, project of European unification, which still seemed in those far off days before Brexit to be a relevant topic. <laughs> this led me to read some of the copious literature about the development of a European identity and to ask myself how the memory of the French Revolution fits into the versions of a usable European past that advocates of greater European unity strive to create. In fact, uh, the French Revolution is rarely mentioned as part of a uh, common European past. In one sense, the reason for this is obvious. As the adge adjective French reminds us, 1789 was first and foremost an event in French national history, unlike, say, the Enlightenment or the two world wars, which are frequently referenced in uh, discussions of a European heritage. Nevertheless, the absence of the revolution and discussions of the revolution of the European project does seem to me to pose a problem. Uh, if one thinks of the challenge of, fa of uh, facing Europe as that of welding disparate subunits into a larger whole through a democratic process, the example of the Constituent Assembly immediately comes to mind, uh, as it clearly did, for example, in the case of two scholars who have written about European uh, identity, Chiara Botici and Benoit Chaland, uh, who have uh, written that the proposed European Constitution of 2005 failed because it, quote, was the product of academic and elite horse trading instead of the result of a true constituent assembly. That the DNA of the French Revolution has been incorporated in the contemporary European project is clear in documents such as the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms of 1950 and the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, drafted in 2000. Both of these documents follow the model of the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in setting forth a list of individual rights that European governments commit themselves to respect and in identifying representative democracy as the only political system capable of implementing those rights. Even many of the social rights mentioned in the European Charter, although they have no equivalent in the 1789 Declaration of Rights, can be traced back to the more egalitarian Declaration of Rights of 1793, which added rights to education, health care, welfare, and employment to the freedoms enumerated in the 1789 document. 
Ironically, however, for more than a century after it occurred, the French Revolution stood in European memory as the quintessential example of historical violence, and violence is what the European Union is supposed to banish from European life. Even today, both in France and in the rest of Europe, the revolution remains indelibly associated as much with the excesses of the reign of terror as with the birth of democracy. The Catholic Church still remembers the uh, revolutionaries often violent anti-clericalism. Uh, Dutch, Italian, Swiss, and above all Germans long recalled the French revolutionaries as invaders who used force to impose their foreign ideas, including their dogmatic notions about the rights of man. Rather than thinking of the French Revolution's principles as the basis for modern notions of law, legal thinkers throughout the continent long insisted that the revolutionaries did violence to the basic principles of judicial fairness, setting up arbitrary revolutionary tribunals, and disregarding basic procedural safeguards for people and property. France's national anthem, the Marseillaise, is a ferocious call to arms against the country's present-day European partners that sometimes embarrasses France, France's leaders at public European ceremonies. This memory of the French movement's aggressive nationalism ensured that the revolution could not easily serve as a unifying element in the construction of a pan-European identity. During the 1950s, the prominent American scholar R.R. Uh, R. Palmer proposed that we think of the period from the 1760s to Napoleon's seizure of power as a transnational age of democratic revolution. Palmer's age of the democratic revolution appeared just as the process of post-war European unification was getting underway. The Palmer thesis clearly has the potential to provide a usable past for Europe in search of a common democratic heritage that would contrast with the nationalist, fascist, and communist movements of the 19th and 20th centuries that generated so much intra-European violence. The Palmer thesis, however, was not uh, eagerly accepted in uh, Europe when Palmer put it forward in the uh, 1950s and early 1960s. It was derided at the time by Marxist historians as NATO history, an attempt to deny the narrowly bourgeois character of the 18th century revolutions uh, and to uh, obscure the violence with which that class imposed its authority on the working masses. In France, Palmer was denounced for questioning the uh, uniqueness of the French Revolution and putting it on the same level as the small-scale and unsuccessful movements in other countries. Conservative scholars of that period in France and elsewhere blamed the French revolutionaries as the originators of totalitarian democracy, <coughs> drawing lines from the reign of terror to fascism and communism. Historians devoted to the national past of their own European countries were reluctant to embrace the memory of the uh, short-lived Republican regimes established under French patronage, which sometimes seemed to have uncomfortable similarities with the collaborationist governments of World War II. In 1989, on the occasion of the bicentennial of the storming of the Bastille, the French government of socialist president Francois Mitterrand went all out to anchor the event, not just in uh, French memory, but in that of Europe as a whole. And this effort had some success. Governments and universities throughout Europe uh, sponsored conferences and exhibitions, often in venues that associated the commemoration of the revolution with the uh, most prestigious uh, sites in the host countries. The bicentennial of the revolution was the uh, theme of the annual set of European unity postage stamps issued by nearly all the countries outside the communist bloc. Indeed, in a rare show of unity across what was then the still standing Iron Curtain, East Bloc countries such as the German Democratic Republic also printed special stamps to mark the occasion. Nevertheless, the bicentennial was also the occasion for a marked revival of critical perspectives on the the French Revolution. When she arrived in Paris for the official celebration of the bicentennial, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher outraged her French host by remarking that, quote, human rights did not start with the French Revolution. 
Uh, Thatcher's point of view was shared even by many French intellectuals of the 1980s. For more than two decades prior to the bicentennial, Francois Fure, an internationally known figure, had been leading a scholarly movement to question the shibboleths about the revolution that had become deeply embedded in standard French accounts of the period's history. To the right of Fure, some polemicists took up the cause of the Catholic counter-revolutionary revolt in the rural western region of the Vendée, uh, labeling its repression a genocide. When Mitterrand's government tried to find common ground with the Catholic Church by enshrining the priest and defender of human rights, <coughs> Henri Grégoire, in Paris's pantheon, uh, the widely respected Archbishop of Paris, uh, Jean-Marie Lustiger, refused to attend on the grounds that Grégoire, a supporter of the revolutionaries' remodeling of the church, uh, was still classified as a schismatic who had defied the uh, orders of the Pope of the, his day, Pius VII, uh, to give up the title of bishop he had received during the uh, revolution. The Bicentennial saw not only the revival of traditional criticisms of the French Revolution's violence, but also the articulation of new ones. Feminist scholars highlighted the decrees passed during the Reign of Terror, banning women from participating in politics and attempting to restrict them to the private sphere. Scholars looking at the revolution's treatment of the 800,000 slaves in France's uh, overseas colonies emphasized the legislators' hesitations about the issue and the fact that their historic decree of February 4, 1794, abolishing slavery, was only passed after the great slave insurrection of 1791 had devastated France's most valuable slave colony, Saint-Domingue, and led to the emancipation of the slave population there. Henri Grégoire, glorified at the time of the Bicentennial as the friend of men of all colors, was also, critics pointed out, one of the promoters of colonial expansion as a civilizing mission, a notion that helped justify the 1798 expedition to Egypt, <coughs> the beginning of the uh, European uh, expansion into the Muslim world, whose consequences continue to haunt Europe today. It can be argued that the memory of the violence of the French Revolutionary era, however egregious it may have seemed at the time and during the 19th century, is no longer a really significant issue in Europe today. <clears throat> Popular memories of the revolution have long since faded, especially compared to those associated with uh, the two world wars and the communist era. I would suggest, however, that the violence of the revolution remains a significant matter for the future of Europe. The French Revolution differs from the wars and genocides of the 20th century uh, that the project of European unification promises to end forever because, unlike any of these other episodes of violence, it reminds Europeans and the rest of us that the positive values associated with today's European Union were themselves the product of violence. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen of 1789 would not have been passed without the storming of the Bastille and the wave of violent rural unrest that historians call the Great Fear. Given the opportunity to act by the wave of violence sweeping the country, the deputies were also acutely conscious that the document they drew up was a declaration of war against powerful institutions and interests, starting with the king and including the nobility, the church, the country's historic provinces, and even the heads of ordinary families who found their authority over their wives and children drastically reduced. The second Revolutionary Declaration of Rights proclaimed in 1793, which can be seen as the origin of uh, the Europe's present-day welfare states, was even more bound up with political and social violence. It was issued in the middle of a factional civil war between rival revolutionary groups the Jacobins and the Girondin, at a time when the country was facing both foreign invasion and the counter-revolutionary Vendée uprising. The contemporary movement for European unification seeks to achieve goals similar to those of the French Revolution without resort to revolutionary violence. This has led some European intellectuals to look to other periods for historical models on which the Europe of today could base itself. Some have developed nostalgia for the Holy Roman Empire, 
the loose and often incomprehensibly complicated institution that bound together Central Europe for many centuries. Uh, Polish uh, intellectual Jan Sadonka has called for a Europe resembling the decentralized feudal world of the Middle Ages. Historians feel obliged to point out that both the Middle Ages and the heyday of the Holy Roman Empire were marked by violence and that neither period foreshadows anything resembling a modern democracy. There is, of course, the English model of gradual and unplanned evolution toward modern ideas of freedom, which the uh, French historian Francois Furet, among others, came to see as a laudable alternative to the French revolutionary tradition. If the European Union does continue to stumble forward for several centuries, historians may look back and see more similarities than we might expect between the long and winding path that led England from Magna Carta to democracy and the evolution of Europe. At a moment when Britain is in the process of quitting the European Union, however, the English model hardly seems to speak to other Europeans. In contrast to the particularist British model, the French Revolution thus remains, as the French say, incontournable, as a reference in thinking the contemporary European project. Even after more than two centuries, 1789 still haunts European minds as the archetypal model of how a society can transform itself and uh, the values of liberty and equality remain the lodestones to which they orient themselves. This is clear above all in the writings of the most self-conscious philosophical advocate of European unity, Jürgen Habermas. From his first major work, the structural transformation of the public sphere down to his most recent essays, Habermas has always seen the last decades of the 18th century as the critical moment in the formulation of modern ideas of freedom. The Enlightenment exemplified democracy as a process of free debate among equal individuals committed to the rule of reason, and the French Revolution was the moment when that debate was translated into political practice. In his more recent essays on democracy in Europe, Habermas invariably resorts to language taken from the French Revolution in defining democracy. When he writes in his recent essay on the crisis of the European Union that, quote, democratic self-government means that the addressees of mandatory laws are at the same time their authors, and that, quote, in a democracy, citizens are subject only to those laws which they have given themselves in accordance with a democratic procedure. He is echoing Rousseau's social contract, but also the specific language of the Declaration of Rights of 1789, whose Article 6 declared that, quote, the law is the expression of the general will. All citizens have the right to participate personally or through their representatives in its establishment. Habermas has always been aware, however, that the violence of the French Revolution poses problems for the defenders of democracy. In the most widely read of his works, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, it is noteworthy that he makes only the briefest of explicit re uh, references to the revolution, even though it occupies a central position between the historical moment of the Enlightenment, his model of a truly open and egalitarian public sphere, and the emergence of what he stigmatizes as a pseudo-democratic, bonapartist private public sphere, manipulated by authoritarian rulers and selfish private interests. The French Revolution was certainly in Habermas's mind. It's passages in the uh, structural transformation on the institutionalization of individual rights in bourgeois society and on the political significance of public opinion clearly evoked the revolution without mentioning it explicitly. In an essay on Naturrecht und Revolution, written around the same time as the Structural Transformation, but published separately, Habermas did grapple directly with the, the subject, clearly distinguishing the French Revolution, which had to use force to impose the rules of natural law on a, quote, depra depraved society and a corrupted human nature, with the American Revolution, which merely needed to create a system of government in accord with pre-existing consensus on natural rights. Habermas himself has admitted that he deliberately avoided more extensive discussion of the French Revolution in the 1960s, 
because he feared that his defense of democracy would immediately be overshadowed by the issue of revolutionary violence. Quote, Indeed, I never discussed the terror, which is understandable given the German context and the overheated atmosphere in the post-war years in the old German Federal Republic, he has recently written. Since the time of Hegel, this connection has been a constant in the confrontations between right and left Hegelians. I was beaten over the head with the frightening consequences of my radical reformism through reference to this threatening connection to revolutionary violence. Habermas's thinking has certainly evolved since his early works, but it is clear that the, both that the French Revolution has remained in his mind as the classic example of the effort to institutionalize the principles of rights and representative government in an existing society, and that he has stuck to his strategy of referring to those principles in abstract terms rather than evoking the historical moment in which they were first articulated in Europe. The caution of the European Union's most outspoken philosophic defender in the face of the revolution of 1789 is evidence both of the unavoidable connection between that event and the contemporary European project and of the difficulties the revolution continues to pose for today's Europe.